That passage sounds familiar is because we read it last week, but it was intentional. We uh, hope that people have, uh, that all of you have profited from the uh, five messages this month. That they are to just by way of review state that the Bible is relevant to mankind. It is exactly what we need to have. It is revelation from God. It is reliable in its teaching. It is resilient from all the attacks that have been made from it. And that's why this passage was used uh, last week. And uh, number five, it is rational in its contents. Now, this passage was given last week to show that even though the king destroyed the biblical text that Jeremiah had written, it was replaced. Let's notice verse uh, 32 in that same passage. Verse 32, the last verse in the chapter 36, says, Then Jeremiah took another scroll and gave it to Baruch the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote on it the instruction of Jeremiah. All the words of the book which Jehoiakim of Judah had burned in the fire. So all of that text was destroyed. And guess what? And besides, there were added to them many similar words. I think God had a few things to say about the evil uh, actions of Jehoiakim. But not only is this a passage that shows the resilience of the Bible, that God just simply replaced it. You know, I, people today, sometimes I think if they uh, could, would gather up all the Bibles they could find and, and throw them in the fire. But it wouldn't do any good. God is the one who gave it originally. It's not going to be destroyed. It survives just as he planned it to. But not only is this a, uh, uh, attitude of disrespect toward God, Jehoiakim is also guilty of irrational thinking and behavior if Jehovah exists. Is this a rational way to deal with? with the word of God? Did Jehoiakim have a reason to, uh, to do this? Does he not know who God is? If he had any sense of history, he would know who Jehovah is. For example, does not Genesis provide an account of creation, the origin of the universe, does he not remember the very first words of their own Bible? Does Exodus not tell how Jehovah led his people out of Egypt where they had been slaves? Does this not show the power of God in addition to what was demonstrated in the creation? Does not Joshua tell how God fought for his people to give them the promised land? If Jehoiakim has any sense of history, he knows about Jehovah and how great his power is. You cannot help know that. You cannot be an Israelite and be ignorant of your history. I would not think. But anybody who does not have a sense of history is also irrational. Those who do not know the past are unprepared to live in the present and will fare poorly in the future. The earth was not created the day you were born. What has happened is important concerning what will Happen, And so it's not rational to ignore the lessons of history. 
Anyone who chooses to ignore the true and living God is choosing irrationality. You cannot ignore what is written in the book. That's not rational. Now, we might ask the question, well, what happened to Jehoiakim for his irrational behavior? Well, we'll see before we close this morning. But let's ask the question, what's irrational? Well, you know, uh, some people think that religion in general and Christianity in particular is irrational. There are people who say, oh, well, you know, there's some good principles in there, but you've got all those miracles. And, you know, that's just not rational. We, we just don't see that. In fact, here's what Richard Dawkins wrote. Next time somebody tells you something that sounds important, think to yourself, is this the kind of thing that people probably know because of evidence? Or is it the kind of thing that people only believe because of tradition, authority? or revelation. And next time somebody tells you something uh, that is true, why not uh, say to them, what kind of evidence uh, is there for that? And if they can't give you a good re uh, answer, I hope you'll think very carefully before you listen to a word they say. Well, I agree with that. People shouldn't just believe something because it's traditional. People shouldn't believe something because somebody says it that appears to be an authority. Uh, but let's turn that around a little bit. Uh, and we will do that in just a moment. But first, let me say something about the nature of proof. We don't need to prove God. We don't have to have the Bible to prove that God is. Now, the Bible does say that, to be sure, but we don't have to have it. And why don't we? Well, let's look at a couple of passages of Scripture. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. And this will show us how that the natural world proves it, and if you think about this, you will have to agree. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, that's us, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You can look at the universe, you can look at the intricacy of human life, the animal population, you can look at the stars and uh, the vastness of the universe and you have to draw the conclusion that if there is a design so magnificent as what we see and experience, there had to be a designer of it. These things don't just happen. That is totally without the experience of mankind in mankind's entire history. And so uh, even though the Bible describes this, we don't have to read this to know that it is true. We have to, as we find an account for how man came into existence and how the world came into existence, we are drawn to the explanation of God. Only someone of great power could create something of, to the magnitude and the extent of what we see. But here's another passage in Psalm chapter 19 verses 1 through 6. There are two points that are made in Psalm 19. One is the power of the evidence of the world 
to show the existence of God. The other is a glorification of the Word, which also shows the existence of God. But we're just going to uh, look at the first six verses. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. Do you need a verse to understand that? Do we not see that? Do we not observe that? Do we have to be told it? But of course, uh, it is the case. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. You can go anywhere in the world and live in any country and uh, speak any language. It doesn't matter. The natural world still is going to declare the glory of God. And that's the point being made here. Their line has gone out throughout all the world, uh, the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven, and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. How do we explain the existence of the sun? How do we explain the existence of everything? We're going to talk more about that, but the answer ultimately is God. And uh, so we have uh, proof as uh, shown us in Romans 1, 18 through 20, and also Romans chapter, uh, or Psalm chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. By the way, going back to Dawkins' statement, why should we accept the Big Bang Theory? Because it's a tradition of some scientists? He said not to regard tradition, didn't he? Uh, the authority of scientists? Hey, I wear a white lab coat. That and my degree from Harvard are all I need to be an authority. Is that what authority is? Is that their authority? Pretty much it is, isn't it? And uh, what about revelation? The evidence is open to interpretation, but nobody reproduces the creation of the world in a laboratory. And so you cannot prove it in a laboratory. So the things that he says we ought to challenge in religion, is he willing to challenge that in, quote, science? Now, what are some ideas that men have had concerning our origin? Well, one was that the earth was hatched from a giant flying egg. Okay, well, question, where'd the egg come from? Uh, an explosion of matter created the universe. Uh, where'd the matter come from? And uh, the answer to all of these is in Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And somebody says, well, where did God come from? Now we have an intelligent question. We don't know where a giant flying egg came from. We don't know where the, the matter came from that is supposed to have uh, formed the universe. And uh, so this is a legitimate question. If we're going to claim that it all comes from God, and the Bible does claim that, then this is not a bad question. Where did God come from? However, uh, there's an answer to this. And the answer is found in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14. Now, if this verse weren't in here, we would still get to this same place. We may get to it sooner by looking at the Bible, but we would come to the same place that we're going to be right now. Where did God come from? Actually, the answer to this question was in a question that Moses asked God concerning his being told to go to Egypt. And Moses uh, says in verse uh, 13, When I come to the children of Israel and say, The God of your fathers has sent me, to, uh, sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who 
I am. And thus he said, thus shall you say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. I am expresses eternity. God had no beginning. God has no ending. And you say, well, that's, that's hard to understand. Yes, but it does answer the question. Whereas we have no answer otherwise. We don't know where the giant flying egg came from. We don't know where the matter came from. We have no answer at all. However, someone who is eternal, although hard to grasp and understand, makes sense. Because everything had to come from somewhere, why not from a being that is eternal and is over anything that he can create? Evolutionists must say that they don't know where the matter came from. They can't tell us. And further than that, they cannot demonstrate how matter became living. They can't explain how matter developed life and intelligence and honor. You can see a lot of the matter of the universe lying around. You can go walk in a forest. You don't see intelligence. You don't see logic. Where do those things come from? Again, the Bible has an answer for that. Evolutionists don't have one, and it's a rational answer. God is eternal, and he has always existed. And therefore, since we are made in his image, we have intelligence because it reflects his intelligence. Intelligence had to create this universe because it gives evidence of intelligence. And uh, we have the ability to think and reason because we get that from God. We're created in his image. Trees, rocks, dirt, stars, comets give no evidence of reason, logic. We get that from God. In fact, God commanded his people, come now and let us reason together in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. God approaches mankind on an intellectual basis. Matter doesn't approach us at all. I've never seen a giant flying egg. So we don't get anything from those, but we do get it from God. The explanation in the scriptures is rational. The other have no explanation or an irrational explanation. So the existence of God is the only rational explanation for the universe. But now, let's go back to where we were a few minutes ago. Suppose somebody says, well, what about all those miracles? Well, wait a minute. Is that a contradiction to read about miracles in the scriptures? Now remember, we have a God who is powerful enough to create the universe. We don't even know where it ends. It goes out for billions of miles. There are stars in the billions. This is so vast, we don't even comprehend how huge it is. And the God who created all that can't do a little miracle? Why should that be thought incredible? If you have a creator with that kind of power, it must be pretty easy to heal somebody who's sick, don't you think? So I don't know why the objection is always given to miracles when we're dealing with somebody who has the power to create all that we see, including our lives, including our bodies. There are many instances of 
reasons for why miracles are. First of all, it was to convince Pharaoh and Israel, the ten plagues of Egypt, this is why you should listen to Jehovah. Look what he can do to your society. Look at the power of destruction he has. And eventually, Pharaoh got the message. Manna was rained down from heaven daily for the 40 years that Israel was in the wilderness. And it showed that they could depend on God to supply what they needed. How about the battles in which they opposed enemies greater and far mightier than they were and more skilled? And yet they won them and the reason was so that not only Israel would know the power of God, but so all the other nations would also. In fact, that's exactly what we read in Joshua chapter 2. Verses 9 through 11. Uh, they came uh, to Rahab and she said to the two men, the two spies that Moses had sent, I know, now notice this, no battle's been fought on their soil yet. But she says, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us. And that all inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. And why was that the case? Well, she says, For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you. <clears throat> and uh, let me pause for a sneeze. <coughs> there. <clears throat> now we can continue. Uh, the, the Red Sea was dried up for you, going back to uh, verse, um, chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. And uh, so we find, uh, as it continues, it says, The terror is upon you, and people are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea, for when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. So they had heard what happened to Pharaoh's army. They knew about that. Even though it was 40 years earlier, they knew what the situation was. More recently, they had destroyed these two kings. Now notice the conclusion. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did they remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Don't ever think there wasn't a purpose for miracles. These are not done just for the fun of it, they had a purpose. God had a purpose in mind for them, and it worked exceedingly well. Then uh, another time we could go to the contest between Elijah and the 450 false prophets of Baal. The prophets of Baal called all day long, all 450 of them. They cut themselves. They bled. They tried earnestly to get Baal to consume their sacrifice. Nothing happened. Why? Because Baal is a false god. Baal has no power. Baal doesn't really exist. They made him up and ascribed to him power, but he had no power. And so after an entire day, their sacrifice remained unburned. Elijah did something kind of unusual. He said, bring out some water and pour it over the sacrifice. So they did three times. It was in a ditch all the way around the sacrifice. Then Elijah called out to God. Fire came down from heaven, consumed the sacrifice and all of the water that had been poured out. 
Now, at the outset of this contest, Elijah encouraged the people to make a choice. They answered him not a word. But after this demonstration, the people said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. You know, that is a pretty good conclusion, isn't it? Not Baal. No evidence. But God answered Elijah's prayer and consumed the sacrifice. There is a reason for these miracles. And then uh, number five, to know the truth. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, John 8, 31 and 32. But let's read uh, another verse or two, John chapter 14, verse 11. John chapter 14 and uh, verse 11. Believe me, Jesus said to his disciples here, Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. The miracles were provided for the purpose of evidence. And in fact, John says that toward the end of his book in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. And truly, Jesus did many other signs. In the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, John, John couldn't even record them all. But these are written. Why? That you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. These are not here just to make some sort of foolish claim. These are here for a reason. The miracles are recorded for a legitimate reason wherever they appear. And that is to provide the evidence. People like Dawkins are always saying, where's the evidence? God gave the evidence. He gave it to Pharaoh. He gave it to the people of Elijah's day. He gave it to the people in the first century. And it has thus confirmed what the Bible says. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Hebrews chapter 2, beginning with the first verse. Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing witness, both with signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts, of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. The miracles have provided the evidence that the Bible is true. The miracles have provided the evidence that Jesus is the Son of God and is our Savior. The Bible is rational. It does not do like the New Age movement which tells us, oh, we're all gods. You really think that sounds rational? It does not tell us that we will become God with our own planet and wives to populate that planet. Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormons, told his disciples, God himself was once as we are and is an exalted man. Can you imagine that? One of his followers said, Rephrased it this way, as man is, God once was. And as God is, man may become. This is not rational because now we still don't have an answer to where did God come from. If God was once a man, where did that man come from? We don't have an answer to that. And so it contradicts what the scriptures 
have said that God has always been eternal and all powerful. He cannot be these things if he evolved, and yet Mormonism would have God evolving. You see what happens? You see the trouble that man gets into when he tries to invent God? Instead of recognizing what the Bible reveals, we, we've often made the point that, that man could not sit down and, and write this book. Well, Smith wrote one, and look at how full of contradictions it is. This is how we know the Bible is the Word of God, one way, because of its perfect harmony and unity. One man can't even get it right without making up stuff that's absurd. Now, we do not have time to show all that the Bible teaches regarding salvation this morning, but it is all logical. The book of Hebrews gives a very logical explanation about how it all fits together and why we need a Savior, High Priest, King. It is all explained. You have to read the Old Testament and you have to read the New Testament that explains all of these things, but it is all set forth in logical fashion. It is not like so many, quote, Christian theologians say, oh, you just have to take a leap of faith. No, there's no leap of faith in the scriptures. Is that, is that what Moses told Pharaoh? Pharaoh, you just need to have a leap of faith here that I'm telling you the truth. No, God provided evidence. Is that what Jesus told people? Is that what Elijah, Elijah told people? You just need to have a leap of faith? No, evidence was shown. They would not have conquered the land. Rahab and the inhabitants of uh, Jericho would not have been intimidated if Israel had left Egypt on a leap of faith. I don't think that would impress anybody, except modern theologians. They, th they think that's cool. No, it's evidence that we're dealing with. And uh, so let's answer that one question we asked earlier. What happened to Jehoiakim? Well, uh, the book of uh, 2 Kings just says that he died. doesn't give us any details. But let's go back to Jeremiah, since Jeremiah records what happened to him, uh, that would be the place to go. Jeremiah is also the one who gave us the problem of casting the word of God into the fire. So let's go and see what Jeremiah says in chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. They shall not lament for him, saying, oh, Alas, my brother, alas, my sister. They shall not lament for him, saying, Alas, master, or alas, his glory. He shall be buried with the burial of a donkey, dragged out and cast out beyond the gates of Jerusalem. Not very flattering, is it? He reigned for a few more years after he did that. But this is the conclusion of his life. Now, in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 36, we have uh, just a little bit more information. 2 Chronicles chapter 36 and uh, verses 5 and 6. In this text we read, Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem, and he did evil. In the sight of the Lord his God, I guess. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against him and bound him in bronze fetters to carry him off to Babylon, where he died and got the glorious funeral that a donkey would. Rejecting the word of God is irrational. Rejecting the word of God, a rational explanation for how we came to be, what we are doing here, where we are going when this life is over. Rejecting that word is irrational. This is the result of choosing 
the kind of result that Jehoiakim had is the result of choosing to reject God and live irrationally. And so what about us? Are we rejecting God? And if we are, is that rational? In fact, isn't rejecting any truth irrational? If we know it to be the truth, we can either take truth or that which is irrational. There are lots of other explanations, but they're not rational ones. But you can choose them, but there will be a penalty to pay for that. The Bible is relevant to mankind. It is revelation from God. It is reliable in its teaching. It is resilient from all the attacks that man has mounted against it over the years. Jehoiakim wasn't the last person who tried to destroy the word of God. And it is rational in its contents. This is why we recommend the Bible. This is why people need to read the Bible and study the Bible to know its contents and its message. God has a very simple plan for becoming saved. That is hearing the word of God, believing it because of the evidence that is recorded as we already talked about. Repenting from sins, Luke 13, 3, confessing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and then being baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Now that's how one has sins cleansed and how one becomes a Christian and how one is added to the church. But then there is the matter of living faithfully ever afterward. But this is how one becomes a child of God. If you have never obeyed the gospel, we invite you to do so this morning. If you need more time to absorb and to study the things we have mentioned, we encourage you to talk with us so we can do that. If you are already a child of God but have not been living faithfully, we invite you to repent. Don't live irrationally. If we can help you, come while we stand and sing.